it's really nice to be here and uh, yeah, it's really great to see all the audience, all the people again and to discuss very uh, lively uh, our, our new topics. And actually I changed a bit the topic because it was like more or less a working topic once I uh, was invited to, to give something. And it's more or less now uh, about the influence of interlayer excitons on the optical properties of uh, uh, TMDC heterostructures. So uh, there were a lot of talks today already like about like the, the interlayer excitons. There were a lot of going on today of polaritons, of course. And uh, now we will go a bit into the visible. So I'm doing like a SNOM, but really in the visible. So from the wavelength range from 450 nanometer up to 650 nanometer. And if we are talking about interlayer excitons, then around of 900 nanometers. So really visible for most of the audience here. I think despite uh, Johannes Abate, he is also like more in the visible. Yeah, and TMDCs, of course, all, all of you know they are pretty cool. You can build up uh, transistors out of them. You can build up LEDs, pretty nice stuff. You can also um, try to make like single photon emitter, but for all of their properties, what, they are depending on uh, the, the, the local, local effects like strain, defects, doping, and so on and so on. And actually SNOM gives a very nice platform, especially if you combine it with near field uh, spectroscopy to study such effects and also get uh, insights into in fundamentals like excitons, polaritons, uh, also like interlayer and, and how all these effects go to the optical properties. And now I want to go back to 2019 and I show actually the slide that wasn't published uh, there, now it's published like uh, two, uh, 2021, where I show exciton polaritons. So really exciton that couple to light and propagate and compare to plasma on polaritons or phonon polaritons, you see the propagation can be even more than 12 micrometer easily. It's actually what limits us is the, the, the resolution of this norm. So at some point we are just out of the focus and we do not see the polariton anymore. And then we did the same as actually everyone is doing, it's not boring, it's pretty cool, so you measure it like as a function of a wavelength, you see it from 570 down to 690 nanometer, we look how the fringes changes, we use the dispersion uh, equation here nicely, and we get like the dispersion relation for slabs of uh, um, a thick MOS2, it's like 6, 6, 17 nanometer thick, and what we get, we get like an upper and the lower polaritonic branch, you can see it here and here, for both excitons, the A and the B exciton. And actually, this is already like pretty cool. You can study the dispersion relation for exciton polaritons. It was also done for MOSC2, actually, also a nice result. But what people forget about is when you look to the dispersion, you have your imaginary part. And this imaginary part is giving you like the damping, the damping and the system. So, and you see actually the damping when you look around the transition of the excitons at 605. Oops, sorry, too fast. Uh, that the signal gets strongly damped. And uh, once you plot like the uh, uh, imaginary part of the dispersion as a function of, of, your, of your momentum and uh, compared with your results how your damping evolved in the system you see that a nice looping comes out and this looping here what you see here it's only for strong coupling so this looping only appear if you are in the strong coupling region between light and matter if you don't have it there is no looping that would be just going like up and down so this looping is formed and it was really fascinating once we did, uh, did the measurements and we first actually just studied the damping and we see just it looks like a gunshot a lot of data points and then we look at the dispersion let's try to fit it and then you get that oh it's really we're producing nicely this looping looping shape here and from this point now, I want to go ahead to, to what we are doing now, actually, and now we are like uh, into 2D materials and want to study the optical properties. And it arises a bit uh, from, the, uh, from, our, from our collaboration with Ottakar Frank in Czech. He gave us a sample of tungsten disulfide on gold exfoliate and say, can you study somehow local effect on this sample just by your SNOM? And what we did first of all, we did like conventional micro PL, we did like uh, AFM imaging and KPFM and what we see we had at this sample two interesting areas. We have here one area, here this one layer, which is very, very strongly stuck, stuck into the gold and then we have an area that is like more, more away from the gold. And the result is in the PL is that you have like quenched PL, like low signal, it's coming from this, uh, for, from, from this area here from where it's really stuck. In. And if it's somehow away from the gold, then of course the, the PL is let's say unquenched, a bit shifted, and it's like pretty strong. And if you make a map where you, where you plot like the intensity of the PL as a function of laser position, you, you get such a nice resolution. And here's like, once again, the sketch, okay, why we, see, why we see this quenching or not. And now the question is, okay, what about SNOM? Can we use SNOM? Can we reproduce it? And of course we can. We just take a map at, uh, this was taken at uh, 633 nanometer excitation. And we see like very nicely here in 04, this darker getting area, it's correspond to this area where the tungsten is stucking really to the gold and uh, where, where the tungsten is away from the gold, we see how the contrast change. And that's 
actually obvious, of course, because once you have quenching, you have somehow a kind of doping. Doping influences the dielectric function, and what you are measuring in, the, in this norm, it's the uh, something that is proportional to a dielectric function. And then you can go to some, doing some math, and my student, Oshin, he really has really fight to it to get really numbers uh, on it, and he start calcula calculating, trying to, 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 to get the numbers on the dielectric function. It was a tough time for him. <laughs> he, was, he was hating me for it to do it, and uh, finally he, lucky, uh, he was lucky, and he gets some numbers, and he compared the numbers with ellipsometry data. So we took like ellipsometry image actually like at the, at the bright and at the dark spot, and what we see at the ellipsometry at both spots, we, show, we see like this exactly the same behavior. And of course, ellipsometry is probably like a huge volume, one by one micrometer, and then also like a large penetration depth. So we see like, uh, yeah, no influence of the tungsten in ellips ellipsometry at least. And, then, and, and, and in O2, it's the same. So it was mentioned, the different penetration depth, that when you look at the harmonics, and we see it in second harmonic, it was hard to get some, somehow to recover, uh, recover the dielectric function of, of tungsten. But once we go to the fourth harmonic and use the inversion method and calculate, we get still negative values. However, now you see they are starting following really the trend of the dielectric function. Of course, shifted, we have still uh, doping effects, and, but we, we are able to, to do it. And uh, finally, I need to mention it. Uh, so Dimitri Basov did exactly like the same experiments. However, we did only three points. And because we then focus on tip enhanced BL, he do, do, do like a very nice full resonance curve where he showed the whole uh, dielectric function of it was MOSC2 and tungsten d selenide very recently. A very nice work. Yeah, but coming from that, I mentioned we go for tip enhanced BL. And that's really cool and that's really interesting because I'm also like coming from the field tip enhanced Raman and tip enhanced BL. And what we see is okay, let's make a line scan from the dark area to the bright area of tip enhanced BL. And what we see, the intensity is once you reach here this border, the edge here, it's going just up and then it's continuously high. It's it, in nanometer resolution region, so, so several tens of nanometer just depending on a step. But what is more interesting is actually that when we look at the PL position, we see that whenever the SNOM signal goes up, our PL position shifts to lower energies, and vice versa, when the SNOM contrast goes down, the PL position shifts to, to higher numbers. And actually, so there's a correlation between PL peak position and SNOM, con uh, SNOM amplitude. And the reason is also like a bit obvious once you start thinking, so we are still somehow, uh, we, we are still um, somehow uh, related to the dielectric function in, uh, in, the, in the amplitude signal, and that means when we dope a sample, and we are here on gold, so we have a lot of doping going on, so we modify its optical properties, we shift the dielectric function. Of course, the band cap also slightly changed, and this you observe also in PL, so this is really like a nice result, so we have a correlation between tip enhanced PL and SNOM itself, and you can draw some. And uh, the funny thing was, uh, after we uh, published this data, the first question that I got, that comes from Neaspec, from Dimitri, from Rainer, a lot of, how you can be sure that you have tip enhanced PL? Well, that's right, that's a good question. Yeah, we make an approach group. Yeah, but you do the approach group for the, for, for, for the SNOM. And, okay, then you start discussing how I can prove that I have really, in the SNOM, tip enhanced PL. The point is, for, from a point scatterer, it's obvious, you know, when you just, when you are away from, from your scatterer or your point scatterer, your signal is gone. We have here a large 2D material. That means I have a big spot, three micrometer. I put a tiny tip inside, and I see like maybe a bit of larger signal. Is this really tip enhancement or is it a focusing effect? Is this a mirror effect? What is it? And actually to give like a possibility how to at least demonstrate that you have and or actually demonstrate your supervisor for the students that you have the resolution to say I have tip enhanced PL, we go, we, we go to graphene. We take graphene as a probe. And the conventional tip enhanced Raman setup, it's like here, you retract the tip out of the focus and you see how your signal decreases. In the, our SNOM setups that we have, actually I think most of us, what, what is happening? The sample is going down, the tip is still illuminated here by the light, so there is the, the whole setup, so we can have this effect like sample tip scattering, still some mirror effect because the tip acts just as a mirror. And we did then several experiments. So we put like a tip down spectrum for graphene and we use graphene because graphene is a constant Raman scatterer. It's this polarization independent. It has a defects mode, which, which is typically very local, and uh, it's on silicon, and so we can use silicon as a reference for what we see, actually, and scale it a bit. So, and then we, we see here this red spectrum once we are in contact. We see a 2D band, the G band, and here are the silicon modes. Then we put the tip up, actually, and what we see, we see a slightly decrease. I, I even don't believe in the last, uh, last uh, was that people see that the signal really goes a bit of down, but still, we have a dominant peak coming just from sample tip scattering. 
And this peak is, of course, we don't know what's ab what about the plasmonics here. Once we remove the tip, we will still have some kind of knee field around the tip, which may also enhance the signal. So it's the same like last uh, told, like in, uh, in the here, we, we need somehow to get rid of this effect. What we do then, we just change to S-polarized light to modify this knee field, and then we see really, oh, it's really decreasing. So it's may maybe really something to do with a, with an, uh, with a mirror effect or some, somehow the near field here at the tip that enhanced somehow the signal. And the ultimate approach for us was we remove completely the tip, drive the sample again into the focus and the same focus like in the first, and then we see a difference tip up, tip, tip down. But still doing like this to, to con confirm to that you have tip enhanced Raman, it's still like telling me nothing or not, not at all. It's like the first proof. The ultimate proof is just scanning an edge. And scanning an edge, when you scan it fine enough, you should see the edge in the Raman spectra when you plot the intensity of the peak. And now we plot the 2D uh, um, peak intensity of graphene as a function when we scan the tip along, uh, uh, along graphene, so coming to an edge. And what we see when we scan from left to right, we see this edge. And when we turn the sample actually by 180 degree, you see it here, we saw that the edge gets bigger. The reason is pretty simple. Our laser is not central really at the tip, it's somehow focused. And it seems that it's like focused through the tip. And it's here like already, once the tip reaching the edge, it's already at the graphene giving like a heart, a, 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 an intense signal. In the second part, when we turn the sample by 180 degree, the laser is actually not anymore like complete. It's like mostly at the silicon substrate. So the signal of graphene is already away from the, from the sample itself. So sample tip scattering gets slower and then the edge gets, gets higher. And what's it's like a very nice second proof is when you look to the noise ratio. So here's like a tip up spectrum. So the tip is away, and when you compare the noise level here of the, of the signal, it's pretty, yeah, let, let's, let's pretty constant despite here two points. It's like the same as here. And once the tip arrives at the graphene, it's, the signal in, increases, but also the noise increases. And that's intuitively, of course, we have near field signal and the graphene is lying a bit of wrinkled. And of course, when the tip is scanning, we will have a stronger modulation of our background. And the ultimate proof is if you are lucky and you have a point scatterer and actually a graphene edge has a lot of defects and we go to the graphene edge, you see when we are at this point, it actually at the edge, the D band appears here. When we are like 20 nanometers to the left or 20 to the right, the D-band is completely gone. This is here something. I don't know what it is. Please don't ask me. It's, I, I, th I thought, think I have something on the tip at, this, at the experiments. It was the whole time there. Yeah, so this is like, this is like a, a proof to have, okay, I have tip enhanced one. This mode is really, it's only appear when the tip was at the edge. It was approached. Otherwise, we never saw this D-band. So it was really like an edge, edge effect here. Yeah, and finally, coming to the interesting part, so going away from TERS, going back to SNOM and going to interlayer excitons. We create a second sample of MOSE2 and tungsten deselenite in collaboration with Tobias Korn from Rostock, and Oshin actually uh, produced them by, by exfoliation. And then we again do photoluminescence, first of all, and we find two areas, like the, we called it north and south, where we see like this photoluminescence, which arises from the recombination of this interlayer exciton. And only there, you see there, the flake is much larger, but only there we have this interaction. So it's also like a probing where you have it because due to the exfoliation, you can have some contamination, some air, some bubbles. You need to have a really nice interface to have this interacting. So to probe, if we, if we have it really, we again make a con conventional micro PL map and we see in the upper region, so in the south, in the upper region, we see very, very nicely the, the interlayer exciton. So we, it's, it's like the intensity plotted here as a laser function. And what we did is we actually want to see is KPFM a possible, is this a possibility to use KPFM to uh, image such, such an area because there is something going on with the surface charge actually and with the, with the working function of the surface. And we go to NEASPEC and right now we buy the uh, KPFM option because it was really possible to resolve this area is really matching exactly the same area like here, and we can see where the interlayer excitons live and where they exist. And you see besides, we see nothing, nothing so, and they are also like in the PL shows, no interlayer uh, exi uh, excitoning going on. And now coming finally, of course, to the most interesting, how about SNOM? And uh, unfortunately, this, this sample died a bit due to a bit of too much laser power during a conventional Raman experiment, so we, but luckily we have a second part. It was here, the left part here, and we do a SNOM image now at, uh, in the, for me, it's already like deep IR <laughs> region, and we have, you see here, the, again, the micro PL area where we have very, very strong PL signal from the interlayer, and we, you can also see it in the amplitude image, like here, like here for different wavelength, and once we go and look also for the phase, you see them also in the phase very nice 
nicely here and here and how it's changed when you change the excitation wavelength. And the easiest thing what you can do is now you just plot it as a function of your excitation wavelength. That is not simulation, it's just guideline to the eye. We are now up together, uh, together sitting together, building up a model to describe it and then you can get also like the uh, nice lifetime, exitonic lifetimes, uh, dampings, and so on and so on. And with that, okay, I want to conclude. <laughs> My time is over. So I think uh, I show you nicely how exciton polaritons are, how we can image uh, disorder, how we can probe interlayer exciton and study the optical properties. And I want to thank, of course, my, uh, my PhD student, Oshin Garrity. His poster is number 12. Visit him at Friday. Very nice data. Uh, also, uh, Otaka Frank and Tobias Korn and the uh, DFG for funding. Thank you for your attention.